Okay, so today for this integral dharma training, we're exploring cleaning up, which is one of the four ups, as they're called in the integral world, uh, waking up, cleaning up, growing up, and showing up. So last week we explored waking up. And now we're moving in um, a very different direction into cleaning up, even though all of these ups are, are inseparable in our experience, and yet it's very useful and practical to explore them distinctly as separate separate um, areas of practice, okay? Even though we can talk a lot about how they interweave, and I'll mention a little bit about that today. So cleaning up, you know, Ken Wilbur created these ups or, or, or named them, and, uh, you know, just sounds nice, the waking up, cleaning up, growing up, showing up, it has a ring to it. Um, but really cleaning up a lot of times, I will prefer to use the, the, the word healing. Um, cleaning up can have some connotations that maybe are at odds with, with the, the practice and work that we do inside that realm. But um, there's so many names we can give to this, but we'll unpack this more. Now for waking up, just to distinguish that really quickly, uh, when waking up, we talked about going to the essence of experience, so not the content of experience, so the essence of mind or awareness versus the content of our thoughts, um, rather than the what specifically we're feeling, like how do feelings happen, you know, what's their nature, how do they exist, arise, and pass, and this, these kinds of things. And if we don't have the category of cleaning up, then what we will say with waking up is like, well, the, re the only reason why you're experiencing suffering is various uh, ways we don't recognize in our direct experience the essence of our, of our experience, the essence of reality. And so the, the recommendation is to transcend the content of our experience or go deep enough to where we don't have to sort of deal with the content of experience. Yet these patterns of experience continue on. So it doesn't really satisfy this healing work that we're going to talk about with this healing work, we're actually going to embrace the, the content of our experience and, and try to work with it and transform and change it, okay? Now, um, there was a little thread in our Mighty Networks uh, private group where someone asked about distinguishing cleaning up and growing up. And I think that's useful too, because a lot of times people will say, well, growing up sounds like cleaning up once you get into it. But again, as distinct areas of practice and experience, uh, for me, the simplest way that I distinguish these two is cleaning up is about the past, um, growing up is about the future. So cleaning up is uh, is uh, working with our experience as we were impacted in the past and it continues to carry forward right now in this present moment. So there's a sense of, of uh, reclaiming our experience in Judith uh, Blackstone, uh, as a great way of summarizing this, to heal means to become whole. So reclaiming more of a wholeness that might've been fragmented or temporarily lost. Um, and uh, for growing up, we're opening up to what we haven't seen yet, what we, what we are going to become. There's a sense of realizing more of our potential and in, in, in particular, opening up to more complexity and to more embrace to being able to include more into our experience. Okay, so uh, they have different flavors. Now, let's dive into cleaning up itself. Um, and then hopefully it'll become a little bit more apparent what the differences are. So again, different words associated with cleaning up, um, healing um, emotional and relational wounds, healing that type of experience, trauma, working in, with trauma and healing trauma. Um, this also applies individually and collectively healing. Okay. Today we're going to explore a lot more towards the individual experience of cleaning up, but this very much applies in many of the same ways to a collective experience. Um, but the practices and what needs to be done are, you know, involves more <laughs> than what's done in individual cleaning up. So, as always, I always acknowledge that um, there are a lot of dimensions to healing. There are a lot of modalities, a lot of approaches and theories and techniques and practices. So it's very hard to essentialize cleaning up. So I'm going to be expressing it in certain ways here, but please don't try to make it into a, an exhaustive 
uh, list or exhaustive description. There's so many ways, even you know, in the realm of psychology, one healing modality, you can find so many theories about the human experience and so many techniques that can be really useful. And part of cleaning up is usually feeling out and finding what techniques would be most uh, useful, would, would most serve us in this moment. I've experienced many different modalities in, in my life that felt really appropriate at the times that I used them. So from therapy to um, uh, healing body work, um, not just healing physically, but that's connected like rolfing, if you've heard of that before, uh, different energy workers, you know, so the list goes on. I've experienced a lot of different modalities. Um, so again, one of the simplest ways to define this is that we had an experience in the past that caused us harm or overwhelm, that we were so overwhelmed by the experience that we needed to adapt and cope in that moment. Um, and there's an intelligence with that, um, but essentially some experience, especially when we're younger, but at any time of our life, this year with the pandemic, uh, many of us are experiencing overwhelm. And right now we're probably all adapting so much. I think this applies politically for, you know, for many of us. I have an, I have assumptions about the community members of Buddhist geeks, but I can't universalize of what, where people land. But for even my theory is that after next week, if, it, if things go the way that some of us want them to go, even though there's going to be happiness, I feel like there's going to be a lot of difficult releasing happening because there's been so much coping with it. And sometimes in, in healing and releasing, it's, it's a, it's a bumpy ride, you know? So I imagine like after through this year, the politic politics that have been happening, the, the, the pandemic, we're going to have a time where we're going to have to heal from the ways we've been coping, you know, to just to, to make it through every day. But um, oftentimes really a lot of us experience various traumas from small to, to big when we're, when we're kids, you know? And so we find ways to adapt uh, to, to survive our experiences. And these patterns then can, again, they're very intelligent when they arise, but over time, as we grow older, maybe as we find safety and, um, and feel that we can start to let go of those patterns, we can enter into healing and say like, okay, I want to work with this. And not only that, I have resources to do that. I have somebody or community or people who can help me through that journey. You know, we're at the time when we coped. The reason why we coped in the way we did that limited our own abilities and, and, and our own being is because we didn't have any other way to deal with it. You know, we did, we did our best that we could. Um, so I want to read a couple of quotes here from Judith Blackson, which I think just really captured this quite succinctly. Uh, in reaction to traumatic events, both big and small, we constrict and fragment our body and withdraw our consciousness from those parts of our body. We organize ourselves in ways that dampen the impact of the intolerable experience or that restrain those aspects of our behavior and personality that have brought harm to us. Um, so she's talking about the body here and we can experience that in ways we constrict the body, you know, so it could be constricting the chest, you know, from, from, uh, you know, experience of betrayal or uh, of, of trust or of love, you know, so collapse in, you know, um, but it's also more than the body. It's like different qualities. So it could be a constriction of the quality of knowing, you know, um, that, uh, in order to deal with what we were knowing, we just had to shut knowing down. Or maybe in, in our the, the family system we were a part of, to know something directly was dangerous or could bring us harm. So we shut down knowing. So there's different ways in which we can constrict or shut down. So uh, to continue here from Judith, these constrictions serve the vital purpose of keeping ourselves intact, of not losing our central organizing function that keeps track of ourselves and our environment. They allow us to manage our environment so we are not overwhelmed by it and manage ourselves so we maintain as much as possible the love and approval of our caretakers uh, that we need for our survival and development. So although our constrictions diminish us and even fragment us, they keep us from shattering. They guard us against the degree of overwhelm that can cause the disintegration of our sense of self, of our sense of existing as a single cohesive person over time. So 
for me, even I, I've, as I've explored many different modalities, um, both in my own personal journey of healing, uh, but also in, in grad school and counseling psychology, I, uh, that summary holds really well for me um, because it, it honors the difficulty we've been through, even if we're still in the midst of processing it right now, there, there's somehow like, there feels like a big hug to ourselves in this moment and our past selves. And we're like, okay, we did our best. And now maybe we feel some possibility to say, okay, I wanna open back up to, to where I might've fragmented in order to, to stay afloat emotionally and relationally. Now, read uh, another quote from uh, Judith here before diving into some more comparisons here between the other ups. Um, so this is a longer one, but I think it, it captures quite a lot here of, of um, what we'll explore with this, uh, this area of practice. So, and by the way, these quotes are from Trauma and, and the Unbound Body. So it's a really great book from Judith. Um, it covers a lot of essential practices around embodied awareness. And she uses the word of uh, attuning to fundamental consciousness a lot. Um, but also in that book, she gives a lot of essential instructions and commentary and also the primary practice she uses, which we're gonna kind of hint at today, which is a constriction release practice. Um, Okay, so I have uh, in the book, she says, I've looked at how trauma disrupts and fragments our experience of our internal wholeness and our openness and connection with our environment. I've defined trauma as any event that is too overwhelming or too painful, too confusing for us to fully experience and to remain present with our whole body, heart, and mind. Described how we constrict our body against the impact of trauma, binding these constrictions. Uh, within these constrictions, we bind the memories and emotions of the traumatic events. We also constrict our body in order to suppress behaviors such as crying or expressing anger that it might evoke traumatic encounters with other people. We constrict ourselves in order to mirror the patterns of defensiveness and openness of our parents or caregivers and to comply with uh, demands from life, such as, to, uh, such as uh, not to be smart or to be less active or noisy. Um, and we can harden ourselves into shapes that compensate for the limitations caused by these constrictions. For example, by jutting out our chest to mimic power when we have constricted and diminished our actual power. So that quote there was pointing at like the different ways that we might do that. And really there's a myriad of ways in which we adapt ourselves. So, you know, this sticking out of the chest to try to feel that sense of power, even though if we really dive in and we, you know, we've constricted that power. Um, or it could be constricting our voice rather than speaking with the fullness of our voice. We speak a little quieter and maybe that feels a little safer or it could be opposite. Got to speak loud to be heard in this family. And I'm going to talk loud, you know, and, and, and really it's like, maybe I want to be a little, I want to access the, the full range of my voice. So many different ways um, that this all arises. There's also, you know, the golden shadow as it's called where we can project out our good qualities onto other people, you know, like, wow, you're so smart. Um, but, and we think, oh, I'm, I'm not smart. You're really smart though. I really admire that in you. And so with that, there's gonna be a constriction of our own experience of our own intelligence, our own understanding. Um, and so sometimes we can sniff that out a little bit by seeing who we really admire. Now in my life, sometimes that's been true of like projecting outward, but then sometimes, you know, um, People are very different from me and I admire how they're different. And so I learn how to like, uh, you know, cultivate those qualities or, or access them myself by like observing them. So um, it's not to say that like, if you're saying, oh, you're really smart or you're really powerful that we're somehow projecting automatically, it's not necessarily true. Um, so when we're moving towards doing this work for ourselves again, it, there's all, we always have to have a sense of safety, okay? Um, where we can open up into it and we have to take time, the, the time that we need, patience, loving kindness, compassion for ourselves. Um, the forcing just does not work in, in this realm of, of cleaning up. In waking up, we can have that sense of going for it, you know, sometimes and just gonna go all out. And if I just effort enough and practice enough, then I'm gonna get there. But sometimes it's quite opposite with healing where it's just like, 
softness, gentleness, and patience to, to really listen to our experience, to what's what we've experienced in the past and how it's showing up now. And also to really find our way through what practices and modalities uh, might help us most. So safety is really important. And this is why with the embodied awareness practice and, and, and the attunement practice we do from Judith's work, we automatically started tuning to a sense of wholeness in the in the in our experience in our body. And uh, Judith uses the word uninjurable. So there's a quality that permeates us that is uninjurable, that we don't have to first heal everything before we can experience some sense of safety and, and wholeness within ourselves. Now, by doing the cleaning up work, we can have a more full cohesive experience of this wholeness, a more full experience of the waking up qualities that we, we cultivate in the waking up uh, area. But that's really important. Um, so, and that's why, you know, uh, we already in this training, we started with a little bit of that attunement. And um, also with that, the phrase for me is always, there's more room for everything. So the, the more that in waking up, I'm able to let go and open up to the vastness of experience, the vastness of mind, the, the spaciousness of the body. I feel I have more room for all those difficult experiences that I'm carrying, you know, and I can say, okay, breathe, breathe. It's like a big deep breath. Okay, now let's go into this content. And for me, there's usually a, an ebb and flow there of like, okay, I'm going to do the work and the, you know, it can be messy and hard and sticky and difficult and then breathe open up again, go back into it, breathe. So I I sat with that question for a while of like, okay, how do these two relate? Because I feel like they relate for me. And that's in my experience, how, how they relate, how the two can serve each other. So now the payoff of this experience, another quote from Judith of like, okay, well, when we clean up, what can happen? What are, the, what are, what are some of the things that we can experience? And I feel like this is summarized here in this quote, to be in contact with our body is at the same time to be open to our environment. Everywhere that we are in contact with ourselves within our body, we are alive and responsive to the world around us. This produces a lived experience of continuity and connection with everything and everyone that we encounter. And also she'll use the phrase, we can think, feel, and sense simultaneously. And also we have more of the ability to think, to feel, and sense. So we, again, fragmentation to wholeness, to have more of who we are in this moment. That's the practice here is reclaiming our own being. Growing up, the sense of who we are gets bigger. And again, I, I want to highlight, you know, the collective healing that I, I hope it's like un, unavoidable to, to notice these days, I and mean, it'd be a longer conversation, but we have a lot of collective healing we have to do. Um, the, the, the level of fragmentation seems to be pretty maximum right now for a lot of us, at least that's my experience. And in that realm, there's a lot of, of exploring unconscious ways that uh, as a we, we've engaged with each other and especially between different groups of people, but systemically because it's interesting, like when we look at an integral, we talk about the four quadrants and one of the quadrants is systems. And those systems that are external can get imbued with unconscious ways of, of relating to each other that causes harm. And um, we have to claim that we have to go back in and own these ways in which we have collectively caused harm in order to, to uh, provide a sense of safety collectively in order to reclaim more of ourselves collectively but it's such an interesting it's so much more multi-dimensional when we talk about it so that's the reason why that could be its own full session is is diving into that version but i would did want to make mention of that because i don't know i think a lot of us are feeling that right now i think doing this kind of cleaning up work on the individual level can really indeed serve this bigger collective uh effort and um i i I would think that it would almost be impossible if, if we're not doing our own individual cleaning up, that it's going to be pretty impossible to do collective healing up, uh, collective healing work. So um, it, how does cleaning up support growing up? Again, if we're freeing up our energy and our being, we're going to have more energy to apply to this idea and experience of growing up. 
if our energy in this moment and our, our being is being hijacked by these protective patterns, we have less energy to give to other practices like waking up or uh, like growing up, you know? So again, it's like how much battery, if you want to say how much vitality do I have in this moment that I can give to other types of practices, cleaning up is going to allow us, uh, give us more. Growing up, because we're, we're growing up and expanding and being able to include and embrace more, I, my experience is that I have ability to see more of the ways in which I need to heal. And I have more cognitive ability a lot of times to apply to that. But we have to be careful of, because also with growing up, sometimes uh, the experience is that you can cognitively grow up so much that we think we've healed <laughs> and we haven't, you know, like the healing parts of ourselves that feels that, that had the impact of, of, of the harm and overwhelm still needs to be integrated and, and met. And uh, we can leverage the power of, of our complex minds to do that. Also, this is a whole nother potential tree branch here of discussion, but um, Kim will talk about at each, as we grow up, we have potential new shadows that can come online that couldn't have ex existed before. Um, and I don't know if there's a good way to, to summarize this, but uh, if, if you've raised a kid or in the process of raising a kid, or just remember yourself as a kid, you can remember like what kinds of problems were we experiencing at different times in our lives? And it's, you know, right now my stepdaughter is uh, six going on seven, but then sometimes she appears like a teenager. But I, I know that like the, the, the struggle she has now is going to be very different from then. <laughs> so, but this continues on. It's not just like we reach adulthood and we stop developing. So this pro this idea of cleaning up and growing up seems to be just an ongoing process. Like there's not an apex where we arrive and say, ah, I've cleaned up, done. <laughs> Even as we grow up, like, okay, there's new things that we realize we've been missing. And through missing, we usually have um, caused some sort of harm to ourselves and others through that missing. And then through growing up, we can see that and we can reclaim and heal. So now um, for practices, uh, today we're going to just hint at these constrictions that we carry in our body. Um, this, the full constriction work that Judith does is much better done one-on-one -on -one, uh, and because it's very personal. Um, but I want to read one uh, quote here that will point a little bit to the work to be done in the constrictions uh, from Judith. I just, uh, when these constrictions are repeated over time, these movements into constriction either become well-worn um, habitual reactions to circumstances that remind us of the traumatic events or even harden into rigid immovable binding within our body. And uh, even though these movements into constriction are spontaneous and conscious, there is still an agent of movement or our own will along with the feeling of our mentality at that age when we first constricted ourselves uh, that is revealed as we release this binding. So this is kind of good news at first. It's sort of being like, oh, I'm the one who binded myself, but, you know, I didn't, I wasn't the one causing the harm, you know, such that I had to bind. But the good news is if, if we are constricted, we can also release that constriction. So again, if we feel safe enough in this moment to work with a particular constriction, we can start feeling into that intentional movement in which we're constricting and binding the body or binding our internal interior capacities, right? And um, so that's why we're gonna, we can start hinting at the constrictions is because that's where the work is. And in that it can actually be paired with other modalities really well. So memories can come up, um, feeling tones and random yeah, random images and thoughts can come up that we can then use in different forms of like talk therapy, for example, could, re could lead to other things of like, oh, now I'm gonna go talk with this family member who I haven't talked to in a long time. I'm gonna confront that issue. Who knows what's gonna emerge out of that. But today we're only going to, again, hint at it because again, this could be a whole ball of wax, you know, to, to dive into. And that's not what I want us to do today. You, you go as far as you feel comfortable. Um, uh, so let's see. The one, last thing I would encourage you on, again, I've, I've already said this, but take your time with this practice or with any practice, whether what we do today or just on your own, 
I, I encourage you to do the work because again, it's, it's you reclaiming your own being, your own uh, internal capacities, uh, your own fullness. Um, but take your time, you know, take, be patient and kind with yourself. Um, I thought about it like sometimes, uh, like approaching a kitty cat. If you, I don't know if you're not a cat lover, this is not going to be a good metaphor, but you know, kitty cats, sometimes you kind of like approach and say, Hey there kitty, you know, like, how's it going? You're not going to rush at the cat because they usually just run off. Right. And actually I, that's my experience actually with working with difficult experiences. We usually just shut down and I, like, because that's why they're there. They're there to protect us. And so if we just say, I want to go into that, you know, these constrictions, if we're going to personify them and say, no, you're not, <laughs> we're not doing that because you're going too fast and too hard. So that's why for me personally, I found like I have to be approach it with kindness, with love, with curiosity and say, okay, little by little, I'm going to approach this uh, difficult experience. And what I really love about this embodied approach to this practice is that it's in the end, it's weirdly more safe to me than sometimes the talking part at first. Like if I just go into it talking, maybe I might shut down a little bit more at first, but the going to the body, there's something very direct and non-conceptual where I'm just, I'm just going to feel this raw information a little, little by little and let the information surface as needed and then work with that information. And again, we have to just go up to the point where we feel comfortable at any moment. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll get overwhelmed again or shut down and, and it won't be super productive.